Hello and welcome to the Innovation Book Club, the podcast that makes sense of the big ideas that drive creativity and innovation. We're your hosts, Alex Drago and Weiss Bassard, and we believe that while there's never been a greater need for new ideas, perspectives and solutions, understanding exactly what innovation is and how it works has never been more difficult or confusing. So our purpose for this podcast is clear. In each episode, we take an important text from the innovation field, deconstruct it, and then talk through the key ideas to help you develop a more innovative mindset. Okay, so this episode, we're looking at Joseph Schumpeter's idea of creative destruction. The key to understanding Schumpeter is it has to be put in context, and that's actually quite complex. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to try and fly through that early part uh, uh, and in order to get to the value, really, of, of what creative destruction is. Otherwise, we just end up with a superficial understanding. Yes. Yeah, right. Schumpeter was born in a place called Morovia. It's now the Czech Republic. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1893. Um, His family were industrialists, uh, and after his father died, he moved to Vienna with his mother. He completed a PhD at the University of Vienna. He tries to be a sort of public servant, so he's an utter failure as the new minister for finance in the Republic of German Austria. And he's also spectacularly unsuccessful as the president of a bank. He then finds his sort of reason for being uh, when he returns to uh, the academic life. So he teaches in Germany, the University of Bonn. And then he also teaches abroad at the, at Harvard University and also in Japan. But in the 19, in early 1930s, as the Nazis rise to power, he leaves Europe for the USA and he teaches at Harvard really for the rest of his life between 1932 and 1949. He dies in 1950 at the age of 66. So he's relatively young. He is a prolific writer. He writes about two million words in both German and English. And just to put that in context, Shakespeare wrote about 850,000 words, but only in English. He was a bit of a joker. The joke with um, Schumpeter is that he had three great ambitions. One, to be the world's greatest economist. The second was to be Austria's greatest horseman. And the third was to be the best lover in Vienna although he did admit that there were many great horsemen in Vienna, so you can <laughs> can make your own <laughs> mind up about that. <laughs> yeah, funny. So Schumpeter is part of the Austrian School of Economics, so they're, they're on the sort of right of the political spectrum. It's about the dominance of the market. But what separates the Austrian school is the idea that the individual is the most important actor in society. Mm -hmm. And he makes a direct connection between the idea of the individual, the idea of innovation, as a separate idea to that of invention and to that of the capitalist who exploits the invention. And so he says innovation actually requires a different implementation process altogether. So, yes, you need an agent who is an inventor who comes up with something. You need a capitalist who exploits the invention. But actually getting from the inventor to the market is actually very complex. Mm -hmm. And Schumpeter is the first one really to say that's the role of the entrepreneur. That's what innovation is really about. And so what, what he tries to do in his book, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, which is published in 1942, is to try and explain how that process happens within capitalism. But in order to understand that, you have to understand some of the big thinkers of the time. So he sees economics not as this separate social science, this abstract sort of thing. He says, no, it's a result of many different things because life itself is very complex. And he draws on 
Karl Marx and the ideas in Das Kapital and Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Right. So creative destruction doesn't make any sense unless we put it in that wider context. Does that make sense so far? Yes, definitely. So basically it's related to the Wealth of Nations and uh, from Adam Smith and Karl Marx's Das Kapital, the theory of uh, Schumpeter. Okay. So, I mean, Adam Smith, we know ideas around the hidden hand of the market. And he writes this in The Wealth of Nations, and, and that's published in 1776. Capitalism is really at the very start of um, its development. And uh, Smith is trying to explain, well, how do nations get wealth? Mm -hmm. and, and he says, really, what you do is you have a good and you sell it. And... The price of that good is dependent on the amount of the goods that you have to sell and the demand for that goods. Yeah. So the price then is where those two sort of um, intersect. If you have lots of demand, very little supply, price goes up. Right. And the opposite is true, right? So lots of supply, very little demand, price goes down. And so uh, Adam Smith produces this sort of playbook – which is how do you uh, increase the demand? How do you increase the supply? Um, and that's really the foundation of classical economics that really still rules our life today. Everybody intuitively understands about demand and supply. Yes, uh, that's true. And besides that, it's the basic um, uh, lessons you've been taught at a business or economic study. It's so almost uh, besides being taught that uh, in one of your studies, you're also being confronted in, in business itself. Uh, when when prices go lower, then people would know that there are a lot of competition uh, between uh, competitors or suppliers, basically. Wow, Adam Smith uh, uh, says, and also uh, besides that, uh, and the other side is like uh, when there are not a lot of uh, suppliers, the prices are. Are, are much higher so so it definitely bodes in practice as in uh, as well as in education you've been taught this model and but but what smith doesn't deal with is well how do you get new ideas how do you create new types of demands new values within the supply and demand environment yeah and that's that schumpeter's criticism is that if you just take a demand and supply graph, it's one moment in time. It's not It's not realistic. No, not at all. It doesn't show where the demand is originated from. It doesn't show where the supply is going to or, or where it's also originated from. It's a moment uh, terribly snapshot. Yeah. So that's the first key idea. The, the second one is around structural weaknesses of capitalism which Karl Marx writes in in his sort of magnum opus uh, Das Kapital yeah we need to differentiate between um, Marx and Marxism in Das Kapital and then what happened in the 20th century within the Soviet Union because they are two entirely different things <laughs> yeah yes definitely. so so Marx's critique about capitalism is that uh, the famous phrase is everything that is solid melts into air. And what he means by that is that capitalism has this ability to sweep aside everything that's that's come before it. And it's just replacing it, constantly reinventing itself and just constantly creating chaos. Right. Now, the issue that Marx is dealing with is around, well, where does societal progress come from? And his issue with capitalism is that you have a capitalist, same, you know, the same actor as Schumpeter points out, who is employing people to make things and sell them, right? And that's the Adam Smith thing, right? Mm -hmm. But the people who are actually acting, uh, adding the value to those raw materials are the workers themselves. Yes. But the capitalist is the one who's keeping the profits. Well, exactly. It basically misses the social part uh, within the capitalist equation. That, what is the human part of it? There is no human part, basically. 
And that's Marx's point. He's saying our idea of economic value and our idea of moral value have become separated. So it's okay to exploit people. Yeah, that's what basically is critique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the way capitalism works is that it's constantly adjusting to that so that you are forever um, exploiting the proletariat in order to create the profits. Yes, yeah. That, that Adam Smith is talking about in, in terms of demand and supply. True. What Marx is saying is how capitalism is going to end is that eventually you'll have everybody working in these factories, but that the system will be so dysfunctional that nobody working in the factories will be able to afford anything. Right. That will lead to a revolution and that will lead to socialist paradise. Yeah, right, right. So the the problem, however, with Marx is that if the revolution is inevitable, why do we need to fight for it? Yeah, we just have to wait until the revolution happens. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so so that's it. Yeah, we just wait when revolution happens, the the people start stop for example working and then they focus on, okay, let's divide all the profits being generated by us. <laughs> and you have socialism. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting contradiction. Exactly. <laughs> but of course, it, it, it doesn't work like that, of course. But what Schumpeter takes is this, the idea of demand and supply from uh, Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. And the idea of capitalism's relentless ability to invent itself. And he's then trying to explain, well, how does capitalism actually do that? And that's really what creative destruction is trying to answer. Right. So to go back to Schumpeter, what we have is within Adam Smith is this circular flow. So all economic activities just are repetitive. They follow a routine course. We know the sort of demand. We produce the supply to, um, uh, to, to meet that. We tweak it a little in order to make it optimum. All firms hang around forever. They're all competing on pretty much the same stuff. Everything is sort of in a, in a state of equal, equilibrium. Right. Now, Schumpeter says, well, this is just not how the world works, right? <laughs> because what, what really influences capitalism is not somebody moving a demand and supply graph around. Right. What's actually driving capital is this idea of the individual. Mm -hmm because they are the ones who are making the decision. And he says, actually, in order to create economic development, what you need is a dynamic state. And what triggers that dynamic state, what produces new goods, what generates new supply, is actually what he calls a spontaneous and discontinuous change in the channels of flow. What firms need to do is to come up with new things that change that flow because by changing that flow they are able to get more profits a disruption within the circular flow basically that's right yeah and the way they do that is through five different means new products new method of production new market new sources of supply and reconfiguration of the organization of the firm to actually um, take advantage of that. So new business model, new value proposition. Yes. So, so the role of the entrepreneur then is to come up with the ideas that are based around those five things. Right. They then produce it, and it's the capitalist who then scales that up and exploits that. Right, yeah. For Schumpeter... What is driving economic development is not moving demand and supply. It is about the what is driving the entrepreneur to intervene within the continuous flow. 
So, so Schumpeter says there is a circular flow. The markets are basically in a circular flow, and inventions, innovations happen when there is a disruption in the circular flow, and that disruption uh, starts with an entrepreneur. So they are the ones who are taking the invention. They are reconfiguring it in a way that creates a new product, a new service, a new whatever, the five things that he says. Right. But then the capitalist is the one who exploits mm -hmm. that. And, th and then that's what creates that discontinuous flow. So the role of the entrepreneur is not a managerial role. Right. It's actually much more, uh, much more creative than that and actually stems from their own personal drivers. Right. And he, he says these motivations are about uh, the desire to find your private commercial kingdom, the will to conquer, the will to prove your own superiority, the joy of actually doing it, of getting things done, of, you know, applying yourself. And that's a totally separate thing to handing it over to a manager who puts it in a business, in a firm, and then they, they, they exploit it using the Adam Smith demand supply. Yes, right. So, so what Schumpeter is saying is economic development comes from the creation of a monopoly. Right. The, the creation of the monopoly means you get monopoly rents, which means you're making more money, and that's what's driving the entrepreneur. Right. But under the Adam Smith model, where everything is at an equilibrium, that's not possible. Right. Yes. What happens then is you actually need this process of change. And that's what Marx was writing about and about capitalism. That's the idea that he takes from Marx. Right. So therefore, what you need is to create economic development is to support entrepreneurship. Right. To create new value, to create... Um, to create not not only new value for a capitalist, but also creates a new value within the whole environment, the whole market. Right. And what Schumpeter says is that this happens in cycles. Uh, an um, enormous breakthrough is made. Mm -hmm. That gives birth to a whole other range of ideas that drives economic development. Right. So the steam engine, for example, once that technology is invented... It's exploited by many different sectors. Right. It follows, yeah. And then over time, the amount of monopoly rent that is extracted from that invention falls because of the equilibrium caused by Adam Smith's demand supply. Right. And then you need another invention. Right. So after steam, it became petrochemical or electrical. And happens again the whole market changes yeah that is the gale of creative destruction the winners of the gale of creative destruction are obviously the entrepreneurs and then the capitalists who are able to exploit that the losers of creative destruction are those who are stuck in jobs which are no longer needed right yeah what what Schumpeter is saying is that capitalism is it's a form of economic change it can't be stationary. It will always be moving because of the drivers of the need for economic development, of the need of the entrepreneur to express themselves. Right. And that revolutionizes the economic structure from within. It destroys the old flow. It creates a new flow. And that is what is at the heart of capitalism. So without that creative destruction... There is no capitalism. It makes me uh, think about the uh, about historical inventions and all the changes certain industry went through based uh, after a breakthrough invention. Like uh, the combustion engine was created and eventually it led to uh, a supply and demand within the whole industry and the other sub-industries were created. Metal industry started supplying things for the industry. Uh, the coal industry grew or whatever it is. It followed afterwards, which created 
uh, a huge smaller demand, but also smaller ones within other sub industries. And the interesting thing is, is it it's it's called the theory of creative destruction. But if you would look at it um, through history, then you would see that um, the whole industry changed. For example, you had um, the combustion engine, and look at it now. Now we are going to an electrical uh, industry, whereby all the cars are becoming electric. Electric. So the whole industries are being shifted. Yeah, and that's why like Tesla is worth so so much more than the old petrochemical, you know, internal combustion engine companies, General Motors and Ford and so on and so on. Because the monopoly rents available through the successful implementation of that are so much bigger in the future than that of the petrochemical industry today. Yeah, exactly. And and Elon is 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 the example uh, for, uh, we could use uh, for the theory of uh, of uh, Schumpeter, where he says, like, uh, there's an interesting value of of entrepreneurs who wants to change things, a new product or a new industry, whatever it is. And Elon is an example of that. He also created a whole industry almost. He triggered the whole industry almost. Yeah. So Elon Musk is not an inventor. No. But he is the individual, the entrepreneur driving the exploitation of the invention, which has happened, you know, by many people over time, right? And so he is that he is that entrepreneur hero. And that's why under Schumpeter, the hero of the story is the one who is creating this, you know, long term potential from an invention. Yeah, so basically a breakthrough invention that's been launched by an entrepreneur in combination with a capitalist who backs him up to produce it on a large scale and in, and with a expert, a technical expert who, who pro, can provide the quality, the true value of the product itself or a service itself. And that's also the case I uh, from Elon. I, I remember an interview of him where he said he the majority of the time he spends uh, with his engineers to try to improve the product itself, and and the uh, and also he spends in his in every week uh, a certain amount of time with the uh, with the manage with the di directors uh, or even the investors to talk to the, them how to scale the business more. So it, it's it's exactly the way um, Schumpeter describes the entrepreneur working. Yeah, yeah. You know, because Tesla can't exist without a network of yes. electrical plug-in points. Yes. And so he can't do all of that. You need, that needs to be created by other entrepreneurs. And together they sustain that cycle. Yeah, true. And, in, and, and, and Tesla is one, not, and Tesla in combination with all those other emerging electrical companies triggers other entrepreneurs to start um, finding new opportunities within the new market. I remember even a university, I don't know where it was, uh, where they invented a new type of uh, battery where, uh, which could be used in cars to drive uh, longer distances. Right. So I see more and more universities experimenting with uh, batteries, how to uh, save more energy in the smaller uh, batteries and use it uh, uh, a longer time. So in, indeed, it triggers definitely universities. We see now uh, entrepreneurs to start thinking about how to create a value from it. Basically, basically, it's the 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 model of uh, uh, the mar the the wealth of nations model. So basically, it, a whole demand increase uh, increases uh, has increased in the electrical industry. So now the supply is responding accordingly. Right, but without the entrepreneur, you wouldn't get that. Exactly, you you wouldn't be able to supply the de uh, supply the demand uh, without the entrepreneurs. You need that definitely. Schumpeter, the the reason that he he thinks so highly of the entrepreneur is that the entrepreneur is the one who is recognizing the fundamental changes across society, seeing the potential, 
and then creating you know, new products and services that can then be exploited. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's interesting how it uh, uh, says how the theory is called, creative destruction. And while, we, while talking now about the electrical industry, it shows how it destroys the previous industry. When Schumpeter is writing this in 1942, obviously the world is at war. You've got an ideological war as well as a physical war. So you've got capitalism in the West. You've got Nazism in Germany. You've got socialism in uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. And what he's trying to say is, look, if you want to save capitalism, this is the way to actually do it. So you need to put it in the in the historic context. Right. But he does add a warning. He does say that he thinks what will happen to capitalism is that it will be replaced essentially by what, what he calls corporatism. Right. So if you have to have monopolies to create economic development, create jobs and so on and so on, then they will exert their power over the nation state and eventually influence the decisions of the nation state for their benefit. And he says what will actually happen is that, for want of a better expression, you know, liberal influences right. will then say, hey, capitalism is wrong. These people have too much power. Right. What we need then is a socialist welfare state in order to take care of us. And for him... That's how socialism happens. Right. And that's why, you know, Americans, I say Americans, there's obviously 300 million of them, but that's why those on the right of the political spectrum in America think anything that isn't the free market is socialism. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so, and so the, the notion of the welfare state that has emerged in Europe and uh, or since the Second World War and in Scandinavia sort of in the in around the time of the depression mm -hmm. is is a complete aberration because they see it as a barrier to the inevitability of creative destruction the paradox in Europe is that we see the welfare state as the means of stopping Europe from fighting with itself as it had done for hundreds of years, and which culminated in two world wars. Right. So what you end up with in Europe is a, an ambivalence towards creative destruction, because creative destruction leads to disharmony. It leads to the kind of revolutions that lead to world war. Right. And so po politicians in Europe tend to be wary of creative destruction. They like the labels of innovation and creative destruction, but what they don't want is the disruption that is caused by creative destruction of whole swathes of industries where people become useless. Yeah, exactly. Well, not only I think in politics, but also within within uh, business or and even in, in education. The label itself is really nice and the, the, the practice or the, the trainings or the workshops or the ideas itself are really nice to talk or do something about innovation. But within the borders of the current industry and the current way of working without disrupting a lot. And what Schumpeter would say or, the, or fans of Schumpeter would say, well, that, that isn't innovation. That's not creative destruction. That's research and development. You're still working within the same long cycle. You're tweaking the demand and supply, but you're not actually giving birth to the new cycle, which is what you need from creative destruction. Exactly. Which is why, you know, Silicon Valley is the epitome of creative destruction. I mean, it's convenient because it's digital and it's easy to reconfigure and so on and so on, but it is the mindset that exists there around creative destruction is totally different to what we experience in Europe. Yeah, definitely. So what you have in what, what you have in Europe is we tend to play catch up. So we wait we we wait for silicon and I'm sure it's not just Europe, but we wait for silicon valley to invent something and then we tweak it and do our own model. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that's what I'm seeing a lot in the Netherlands. And a lot of a lot of uh, companies I see here that are mainly focusing on uh, on on uh, copying uh, startups or companies uh, uh, from the US when they would not move themselves to the to Europe. And even I think it's a Rocket Company. I'm not sure it's a German. I'm not sure which where they are based, but it's it's a uh, uh, it's a company who specializes in 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 creating uh, profitable businesses. But if you look at their portfolio, it's basically copies of successful business in uh, businesses in uh, in the US. <laughs> right, right. It's a European con a, a company, and exactly what like you said, it's it's catching up basically on the inventions from Silicon Valley. That's the key tension within the idea of innovation within Europe is that the politicians are wary of the negative impacts of creative destruction. Well, actually, the way you now just phrased it makes me think about the politicians where they... Um, how it makes me think about their their response uh, to the corona uh, uh, crisis now in the Netherlands, where they... Um, there were certain politicians that would argue that there are a lot of problems, people sitting at home and having no jobs and having no use anymore or no function within society because the whole industries are collapsed or on hold, basically. And we need to ref we need to fix this. They would say, we need to fix this. They, we need to start the industries again. We need to start uh, the, 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 the restaurants and start all those industries where people are now sitting at home. So if, uh, instead of exactly like you described, instead of thinking, what is the next thing? What is the new cycle that Schumpeter says? And based on the new cycle, maybe we should think about how, to, or or even thinking about the new cycle, creating the new cycle, to to make eventually these people, f um, uh, um, yeah, it's, I don't know if it's a good phrase, but making them useful again in society, giving basically new types of jobs. Uh, I don't know how it's been in the Netherlands, but in the UK, we've had this furlough scheme during COVID, right. which is the government essentially saying to businesses that create wider sharing of the coronavirus, they're saying you're going to close and we're going to pay a certain percentage of the salary. Right. So you're paying people to sit at home. Yeah, that's we had the same scheme here, yeah. Right. And and obviously the reason to do that is to stop the wholesale, you know, falling apart of society where an increasing number of people live hand to mouth month by month. They don't have savings. There's not going to be jobs for them. So so you'd pretty much end up with with uh, at the worst case, you know, social unrest and on on the best case, people going back to work because they have to to earn money. Right. But at the same time, you're paying people to sit at home not being productive, either in the Schumpeterian sense of inventing new things, new innovations, or in the classical economic sense of driving growth through demand and supply. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and and it, it reminds me of, uh, um, it makes me think about certain entrepreneurs that do respond to the crisis as uh, 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 from an opportunity uh, uh, point of view. Uh, like I've read, I think, yesterday about uh, someone who has uh, started a company which, uh, whereby he co connects, um, connects companies where people uh, had, uh, where companies where they ask their employers to, uh, to, uh, to work at home and now, but a certain a certain people weren't be uh, able to work at home because they had large families or two small homes, two small houses, or no offices as their homes. So they, this company, uh, a new entrepreneur, started a company where he links uh, those people with uh, with hotels, and he asked hotels change your rooms and offices so they can they can work on a daily basis and rent that out to uh, to their companies itself. Right. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. So, so this this is an example. I think uh, exactly like uh, Shampoo explains of creative destruction, like the whole industry, the hotel and the office uh, uh, worlds are being combined to a new way of working. This entrepreneur can be part of the change of the new cycle, which can which probably will emerge 
um, after uh, or during this corona uh, uh, crisis. That's a perfect example. The innovator is responding to the external environment and they are reco reconfiguring their resources. Exactly. And and the way also the whole hotel industry is responding now, many hotels are just waiting until they are open. But th that uh, one particular uh, group of hotels responded through this entrepreneur okay, we are going to supply office spaces, flexible office spaces to people who are not able to work at home because they have to work at home. Um, uh, so they're responding the whole, I can see a change within the hotel industry whereby they wouldn't be uh, only um, renting uh, rooms or providing rooms, but also office spaces temporarily for people. Right, right, yeah. That would be a good change and, and an example of the cycle which uh, Schumpert is talking about. I mean, if we look at some other examples, right? so the internet is obviously one. You've gone from an analog where everything has to be printed, it has to be physically distributed, and then the internet comes about, and it's this, it, first of all, it's a digital, digital access to what was analog, and then it's a digital distribution, and then it becomes much more dynamic, right? You can interact with people, you can sell things, and so on and so on. So it, it killed off those old industries, but at the same time, it created a whole cluster of new industries. Right. So the internet is going to be the one that keeps on giving and giving because it allows us to reconfigure our resources, mm -hmm. to invent new ways to, to engage. Right. I put some other examples in the notes, you know, photography. Well, it used to be back in the day it was a very complex chemical process that you had to do on a plate glass. Then it became film, you know, just a plastic uh, so, uh, uh, film. And then it became a digital camera. Then it became a smartphone camera. You know, now we have video everywhere. Yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's an, each one of those has created a whole cluster of um, uh, of new businesses, travel agencies. You know, you used to have to go <laughs> to the high street. I want to go on holiday to X, you know, and you pick up a catalogue and you would look through that and you have to speak to somebody. Right. And then, of course, over time, that's been replaced. You know, well, we can offer cheaper flights because you don't have to go to a travel agent. We can offer cheaper hotels because you can book directly, you know. And then there's Airbnb, which, again, reconfiguring those resources, you know, so the idea of travel has has changed. We don't go to um, travel agencies anymore. I can't remember the last time I saw one. I'm sure they do exist, but they're probably increasingly specialized around, uh, I don't know, tours or honeymoons or whatever it might be. But, you know, but, but actually we organize that ourselves through, you know, just through a few clicks. Exactly. <laughs> you know, a, a net, the Netflix effect, right? It we used to be that there was only two ways to consume uh, audiovisual media. You would go to the cinema, you would watch it on the TV, yeah. right? And then it was, whoa, we've got this thing called video or we got DVD. And now it's, of course, it's everybody can set up a media company and, and you don't even need a platform to distribute it because the platforms already exist. True, yeah. Definitely example. Yeah. But but in each case they've given birth to a new new cluster of industries. So the the tension though for if you're in the policy sphere, if you're a politician, is when do you embrace the new things? Because if you embrace stuff that causes people to lose jobs without saying, Oh, we've got a whole new cluster coming. Right. Then you look like an idiot. Yeah. So how do you manage that? And you know, Schumpeter would say Brexit is not creative destruction, it's just stupidity. Because because there wasn't a plan. Right. There wasn't a say, here we've got a long cycle, we can see this what's emerging. This is going to be our cycle. No, there wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it's just like uh, people say well, you know, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. Well, no, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. But the point Schumpeter would say is that people who are advocating for Brexit didn't know they were, what they were making after they broke the eggs. <laughs> yeah, true. And, uh, 
And I think that that's kind of what's emerging now. Is it teething trouble? How long will it take to solve? We don't know, you know, but, but it's the case where the politicians didn't really align with the way that economies function because the driver for Brexit was, was not economic. It was uh, political. Yeah. And that's, um, I remember after when Brexit happened, I was uh, in the UK still. And the morning after I, uh, Google, I think, um, published a article where people where the, uh, where, what the most searched, um, uh, search keywords were in the UK. And it was, what is the European union? <laughs> <laughs> I remember the day after I was going to visit some friends and I'd got on a bus to get there, right? right? And the bus pulled up at a bus stop outside some, I don't know, it was a news agents or a card shop or something like that. Right. And outside the front door was a metal basket. Right. You know, I had a sign saying cheap or sale or whatever. And it was Union Jack flags <laughs> for half price. <laughs> Wow. And I was like, well, that, that is for me anyway, we, you know, because I've dual nationality. I was like, that is a metaphor for Brexit. We have exactly. sold ourselves so cheaply. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. <laughs> well, it shows again, like, um, like what you just pointed out, how politicians embrace uh, the new cycles of how uh, Shamput explains it, how they embrace new cycles, which are being created by those entrepreneurs, uh, which creates uh, those disruptions in the, in the flow. Um, um, and it, it, is it interesting, but because it, it reminds me of, uh, I don't know how I came up with the idea. I read it somewhere or I uh, heard it from uh, some scholar. But he said that uh, when in any economic changes um, by IT or AI, um, the yes, their people are going to lose certain jobs because it's being replaced by robotics or uh, robots or AI, whatever it is. But it doesn't mean they are not able to work anymore. It means that they are going to, uh, they have to do certain other things. For example, he said, if AI is going to replace administrative repetitive tasks, that means those people, yes, they are going to lose their job, but there is going to be a new, uh, there, uh, uh, by replacing this, there is also a new opportunity to manage this, these AI uh, systems and robots. Because eventually, uh, when, ro when robots replace those jobs, and, and somebody has to manage these jobs, uh, these uh, AI systems, somebody has to create these, e e these uh, e AI systems. I understand, of course, that there is a huge gap uh, between the knowledge you need and the, complex the complexity in thinking between managing AI systems and doing repetitive tasks, but it doesn't have to destroy uh, jobs for itself. And coming back to the politicians, it's interesting how they deal with it while knowing that, that yes, market when markets changes, jobs are being destroyed, but other jobs are being uh, created. The challenge for politicians is they work in a five-year cycle or something. I mean, it, the, the, they acknowledge everything that you've just said, but they have to be—they have to win a vote five years later. You know, within the next five years. That's true. You know, and so if it's it, how, how long will it take for a you know a large number of those jobs to emerge? to replace those old jobs. That is true. And the the challenge is that your know, capital is highly movable. You know, you're not moving gold around. You're just moving ones and zeros around in a, in a digital system, which makes it a lot easier that if you are an American car manufacturer, you can say, you know, it's too expensive to make it in the middle of America, but it's, you know, we can save 25% if we do it all in Mexico. Right. So, which is obviously great for the Mexicans, but not great if you're in, you know, Midwest of the United States. And, and that's the challenge because the most popular or the most common jobs within the center of America is to do with moving goods around. It's driving trucks. Yeah. 
So when the creative destruction comes where you have uh, AI, you know, operated trucks, mm -hmm. well, what what do those people actually do? I mean, it's all right saying, right, well, we're going to need programmers and we're going to need this, we're going to need that. But fundamentally, those people that did that jobs, that did those jobs, will not be able to do the other jobs of programming AI. That is true. And that is the, that is the political tension with creative destruction. Yeah, that is true. So, so not only can we s not see over the hill to see what is going to emerge as the next long cycle, we also then can't find ways to create new jobs for the people who have been immediately left behind. And that's what creates the social unrest and the political tension and, and so on that, that some politicians will seek to exploit. You know, and that's why you know from our distance in europe we you know question donald trump but for some people whose jobs are threatened and livelihoods are threatened what they see is somebody who is saying oh what we need to do is bring jobs back to america and, and make america great again when everybody was working and we had all these industries in the middle of america and it's the same tension in britain you know, the long-running north-south divide. Nobody knew or nobody invested in new industries in the north of England. Right. Well, it it makes me think about attitudes, how people uh, see or how they deal with changes. For example, politicians, yes, I understand that truck drivers are not able to suddenly start programming uh, AI systems uh, for automated autonomous uh, truck uh, trucks. But I'm like, okay, are like you said, they can't look over the hill, but are they even thinking about uh, thinking about uh, trying to look over the hill? Are they uh, brainstorming about, okay, how can we, um, how can we create uh, jobs for those people left behind? Because within every cycle, the whole industry, like it's like the title it says, it's creative destruction. It destroys completely the previous industry. Like if we are, if if politicians, I don't know if we are now going into the political space, but if politicians are not able to respond to that, are not thinking about okay when Netflix comes okay the blockbuster DVD industry the traditional TV industry is completely disrupted a lot of companies and factories thousands of people are being laid off okay how are we able to promote entrepreneurship between them uh, or even how to help them to, for new jobs in order to uh, in order to make them also participate in a new cycle. Right. I mean, it, th that's the fundamental challenge with the idea of creative destruction. Yes. You know, how, how do you, or do you even try and overcome the fallout of the creative destruction? And w what are the implications if you don't and if you do? You know that's it for for a politician. So in in the UK, the, re, the project that I worked on, the industrial strategy, was this post EU vision or post Brexit vision about how you create um, new jobs and new industries by by bringing together private and public sector agencies or actors in order to create greater wealth for the nation. But fundamentally, at some point, it's not just about moving demand and supply, is it? No. Yeah, you can export more, but really you have to come up with the new innovations. Right. And can the point Schumpeter is making is can you have 
the new innovations without the destruction. He's saying, I'm not critical of capitalism per se. He's saying that's the way it works. This is my understanding of how it works. Right. And that has implications. I had a telecom business where I sold batteries. And now the whole industry has been shifted towards um, internal batteries for mobile phones. And besides that, batteries are being so dirt cheap that they're not um, uh, replaced anymore. So if I would have had that company still, and the industry has changed towards um, a single use of batteries or phones, or it's so cheap that they're not replacing the batteries anymore. So like, like, how would I respond to the change? As an individual, would I, okay, I would see the change in the industry. That would be a challenge to think about how, what I could do as an entrepreneur. Right. Because the, you know, like I've had my phone now for three years or something. Yeah. The battery is going. I've not thought about, oh, can I just replace the battery? Exactly. I've just thought about how cheap is the next phone that I need to get, you know. Exactly. Like even even now, um, even now I'm as an as a business analyst. I'm um, in the previous uh, uh, months. I'm thinking, okay, what is the wh what would will happen if they would also automate my job? If they would automate how you could basically my job is about how to uh, to help teams work efficiently, work uh, more effectively, and let's assume that within the next ten years. Um, my, um, the, in the telecom industry I'm working now, everything is uh, going through a system of processes where everything is efficient, 99% effective. Then I would lose my job. But, but what? How would I respond as an individual to the change or to the new cycle? So, uh, if I look to the Schumpeter the theory, he says we should, or entrepreneurs should disrupt. Bring in the, there should be disruption in the flows. Well, I suppose the challenge for you would be, assuming you wanted to stay within that analyst sphere, mm. is how do you how do you automate the analyst function, and then sell that at scale? That would be the Schumpeterian response, right? Right. You know, you're you're not playing in the management capacity. No. You're playing in the entrepreneurial capacity. Right. I need a technical expert who would help me set up that system, and I would need a capitalist who would, could who who could help me to scale this up. Right. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. And that's why innovation entrepreneurship is different to execution. What do you mean by that? So. You know, so executing what you know, already know how to do, that's the Adam Smith demand supply. Tweak a bit of this, tweak a bit of that. Yeah. We increase next quarter or next year or whatever it is, right? Exactly. But but really when it comes down to it, you're still the same analyst. You're just a little bit more efficient, a little bit more cheaper, or you have a little bit more capability or capacity. Exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> what Schumpeter would say is, that no, what you need to do is yeah, have a ha, either have the technical expertise to invent something new, or to be the entrepreneur who recognizes that somebody has the technical expertise, and then find a way to create new products and services or business models or whatever it is out of that invention, that technical invention. Yeah. Well, it's it's an interesting point of view, I must say, because it also um, makes me think that it's inevitable the changes, the cycles, the new cycles. So, so it makes me question: What does that mean to me for the next ten, twenty years, even after ten years? Probably my job is going to be a, a platform where people would buy and pay for analytical uh, capability. And eventually, okay, that's the next cycle. And what after that next, uh, after that cycle, that's not the end state. 
It's not a change in supply and demand. It's the new equilibrium, like Schumpeter says, which eventually will also be disrupted and change, change the complete industry and destroy the previous industry. I suppose the, yeah, you're right. I suppose the response would be everything is a platform these days. So the first of all, you need to find a way to measure efficiency in every process that your business does. Right. That is somehow recorded digitally, which goes off to a platform somewhere and you sell analysis as a capability. How much analysis do you need or how much are you prepared to pay for me for efficiency? Right. Yeah, right. And then the, then the analyst function is outsourced so that the people who remain within the business are those who manage that capacity, but the hard work is outsourced. <laughs> it makes me really... Um... Uh, think about um, in a practical way like okay I'm I'm analyzing for example now humans how they do their jobs is it on time is it complete is it also accurate and for example if these people are being replaced by robots then the 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 question would be are these robots configured to act on time as complete as possible and as accurate possible then I would imagine, indeed, to have a to have a software where p companies would buy, plug it in with their system, and my software would measure the the the, the output of their robots and eventually provide real time recommendation. Like these are the tweaks you need to uh, you need to make, and statistically, it will provide you with X uh, um, percentage of growth or efficiency. <laughs> I suppose the other way to think about it is that everything is so plugged in that you are able to have sufficient data that explains or or that shows what the typical resource is needed to do a particular function. Exactly. And then you would be able to compare that to what people in your company are doing and you'd be able to say, well, we're more efficient or we're less efficient and we need to make those particular changes. But it still requires the data. Exactly. Like that would be the new cycle. Analysts wouldn't, for example, uh, exist anymore. It's been destroyed completely by all those platforms. So, okay, what is the next cycle? How would I then respond to it? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's some of the comments about the analysis around the, the, the long cycles is that the cycles are getting shorter and shorter over time. Right. The steam cycle powered the Industrial Revolution, and it lasted 80 years or something like that. And then the next cycle around probably petrochemicals or electricals, you know, lasted 60 years or something. Right. And then so on and so on. So, you know, the, the personal computer, for example, you know, the Apple guys came up with the first computer in the mid-'70s, I was listening to a podcast this week about the history of Google. And if you go, and it's probably the same in Afghanistan, right? People don't have laptops or desktops. They do it all from their phone. Yeah. So Completely. So the, the, the cycle for computers is fundamentally changing. Yeah. Handheld devices. A couple of days ago, I plugged my phone into my monitor, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I've just worked out that all I need is a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse, and I could do everything that I normally do through my phone. Right. I don't, I don't need a Mac anymore. I don't, you know, I don't need this and that and the other. <laughs> Actually, what right. I need is, you know, a, a G Suite and, and a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse. Well, well I think you're right because – um eventually initially if you exactly like you said computers we've been uh, has uh, did replace a lot of other um um tools we use for photography for communication for media entertainment games whatever it is 
and now the the phones are so powerful being so powerful the hardware is so powerful that it almost replaces uh, computers from six years ago maybe not the computers of now but six years ago but if you would look at the average use uh, average way of uh, uh, of the average user uh, how much hardware they would use it's 10 percent 20 percent of the <laughs> of the capacity of a mobile phone so do we, so we, yes indeed you would need a mo a bluetooth uh, keyboard or a mouse and then you would be able to do your job even through your mobile phone so then so if the cycle of you know desktop computers is already in decline that well the, the the cycle of software is in ascendancy how long is that going to last for before we're able to create our own bespoke software. You know, now nowadays you need a technical proficiency right. to to code. Yeah. But uh, you know, in the future, uh, is the software creation process going to be so simple that you can just create bespoke apps? Because you know, we've created a standardized interface. Well, that's that's merging even now. You know, I created my app very very simply on Unity. Right. And just copy and pasted somebody else's code. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it's even emerging now. I'm, I see a lot of low code and even no code application platforms where people would literally come and build a, a, a similar system like Netflix, Airbnb, Uber, whatever it is, by not writing a single line of code, but providing the, with them the capability which uh computer uh, which you, the capacity which you would need five or ten years ago the the, so the coding it replaced completely the coding uh, 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 capability you needed and it's interesting it's even uh, we had we had uh, we had computers where we could do tasks then we had software to to do tasks efficiently and then we needed people to create those software. Now even we have replaced those people who created those software with systems that are already platforms where you just have to register and it's completely outlined. This is the process. You just without any line of programming, you can create a whole project process or a whole process of a whole company or many processes from another company. And eventually I would imagine AI would create for us that. Like we would talk to an AI, right. like this is my company, this is my product. Just do Could this for up? me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> set up a company for me, set up an email, set an automated reply when they order something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, when we think, of, I mean, there's massive implications of understanding Schumpeter as we've just sort of been exploring there. Are we then teaching innovation wrong? For a start, we, we, we do a pretty bad job of teaching what innovation is. If you think back to our MBA experience, it, it was, I don't remember doing Schumpeter, to be honest. We may well have done. I might have just switched off that day. But, but we, we focused around business model innovation, really. True. We're doing a bad job, I think. Why? Because I don't know. It's, if I look to the the current developments, the current dynamics within all in, in, in my environment, what I see on the news, the, all the inventions that are happening, all the the direction, for example, society is going in terms of mobility, in terms of transport, yeah, mobility, transportation, energy, communication. I the trumpeters is like like we just read like we have read about trumpeters like a creative destruction process going on it's the cycles are being it, it, the whole industries are being changed to new cycles the new, a new flow is being created and our innovation my as at least my innovation workshops training books i read is like this is the current market let's invent a new business model within the current situation or let's meet the needs of uh customers which have a particular problem within the current industry well it's interesting to see that schumpeter goes from the top sees it sees changes on the macro level uh in terms of uh or its communication or its transport or it's whatever it is uh based on a te technical invention and says like like okay these are the new cycles 
we are going towards this new cycles, these industries, how are people responded? And there are entrepreneurs within the industry, within the society who responds, uh, respond to the no, new early stage of uh, development of those cycles, which are going to create a lot of, creates, uh, of course, a lot of capital, a lot of money, a lot of whatever it is for themselves, but also trigger the whole industry, uh, creating more sub-industries around it. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm like... And and then I'm like, now, what happens with all those people who are busy with innovation in the current industry? Are they left behind? <laughs> it, it's a valid point. Right. The strength of Adam Smith is, you know, can we find ways to affect demand and supply? Right. So if you want to increase demand where well, you need a bigger market or you need a bigger share of the market, you need marketing. Right. You need a marketing led strategy. Right. Right. If you want to affect um, supply, yeah, then you need uh, operations related strategy. What what can your operations team actually do in order to do things more efficiently? Right, and of course there is massive value in understanding that. But the strength of Schumpeter is just what you were saying: it's the macro approach. This is how capitalism works. There are cycles, right, and there are opportunities that exist within those cycles. How can you find the right cycle? Exactly. And I think, you know, you're talking about analysis there or analyst work. I was thinking about my work in museums, right, mm -hmm. which denies the very concept of creative destruction. I mean, it doesn't even like Adam Smith <laughs> because because the value is created in the manufacturing process by experts. Whether anybody sees it or not is kind of irrelevant right. until you have to start paying your own bills. Right. But whereas with Schumpeter, he's saying the driver is, you know, monopoly rents. Hmm. Within the museum sector, they don't, they don't operate that way. They don't think that way from a macro point of view. So they deny themselves the opportunities for innovation. So what you end up with is tweaks to, to branding you know, tweaks the supply, but pretty much everything looks the same, which is why that they're always saying we can't make enough money to sustain ourselves. Well, eventually it would lead, lead to destruction. <laughs> well, uh, and that's what's happened over the last 10 years, uh, as austerity is bitten. Right, yeah, right, yeah. The, the destruction has happened, but but what they do is they say, oh, well, we're special and, you know, you have to give us some money and culture is important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After destruction, they're still in denial. <laughs> still in denial. <laughs> well, that's that's another way to say it, denial. But yeah, culture is important. If it's so important, why can't you sustain yourself? I mean, is the fundamental question. Yeah. And and if you're prepared to engage with that question, then it's like, well, the product or the service is wrong. Exactly. But if you deny yourself the idea to even engage with with creative destruction, that there is there is a way to disturb the flow and create a new flow that, that might lead to greater sustainability. Right. Then you have a duty to explore that. But but the sector isn't it doesn't even want to do that, you know. Well, it reminds me of the cycle time uh as Schumpeter is talking about, it's, in, it's decreasing. So when the museums 10 years ago, the destruction of the, the, that museum idea 10 years ago happened, right. how many other cycles have been, uh, have been, uh, ha has been happening while the museum industry is still in denial, like, no, we, this is the idea of culture and this is what we are here to do. We are not going to change. We have to just adjust certain supply and demand uh, parameters, and therefore we are going to exist still. While so many cycles happened afterwards, or a few maybe cycles happened afterwards in the cultural environment. So I'm like, well, if you would look through the cycle point of view of Schumpeter, like, okay, this is the current cycle we are in now. The cycle is uh, we are digital, your generation Z, we, was, we are getting mobile phones at the age of one or two or whatever it is, they're being uh, 
uh, taught uh, with, through mobile phones, tablets at home. It's all digital. Playgrounds are being even replaced with uh, trees or parks and so on because nobody is playing anymore there. So, okay, culturally, society has changed completely. So why not respond your uh, respond through your organization as your organization to the current cycle? You know, if if you think about how monopolies are protected. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the marketplace, you protect your monopoly by basically owning the marketplace, right? So nobody goes into search because Google owns search. Nobody really goes into social media because it's owned by Facebook. Yeah. So, so you have that, you know, scale and scope, and that's what maintains your significant monopoly position. Right. If you want to get rid of a monopoly, then it's creative destruction. And we just allow that to happen in the marketplace. Right. If if you're working in a regulated sector, there is no creative destruction, right? It requires a, a government intervention, a legal change to either build or destroy that monopoly. True. Yeah, I agree. So, so you either, you know, antitrust behavior and you say, oh, this is just terrible. We've got to break you up, blah, 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 blah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, or, or you play so many regulations that yeah, if you want to be a museum, you have to be a charity, you have to be, you know, this and you have to be that and you have to be signed off by so and so and blah, 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 blah. And you maintain the monopoly that way. Right. But the challenge in museums is they don't recognize that they're now playing in the marketplace. There's still, there's still, you know, the, the culture is that, well, we're still this different thing that existed several years ago. And so the, 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 the challenge is, well, how do you make that transition? And that's the, that's the big challenge, right? But the cycles, yeah, there's been a whole load of technological cycles, but, but really, if you believe your purpose is to tell people about stuff that you put on display, it doesn't matter what the technology is, analog or digital, you're still just telling people about the stuff you have on display, right? It doesn't matter if it's on a phone <laughs> or an audio guide or a bit of paper or a poster. That's what you're doing. It's that shift. If you say, we're not just here to tell people and put stuff on display, if we're there to do something else, then there are opportunities for innovation that come from that. So you have to make that shift in your mind. And, and you know, the sector, I, my, my experience as a sector doesn't want to do that for several reasons. Right. One is we don't teach it. Right. The second is that there's regulation things in place. And third is that the cultures within the, the museums themselves, it, it, these people don't want to be creatively destroyed. Yeah. Because it's their jobs on the line. <laughs> And that's probably the same in every every sector, every business within the private or the public sector. But within the public sector, that you know, it's harder because somebody's giving you a check every year. It doesn't matter if it's museums, it doesn't matter if it's healthcare, it doesn't matter if it's welfare, it doesn't matter if it's armed forces. But that it's still the same thing. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, it's interesting. Which means you don't take advantage of the cycles. Exactly. Until you have to. Like the army does no innovation until it needs to go to war, right? <laughs> and then it's like first-class innovators because the environment has totally changed. Completely. They suddenly invest a billion dollars in R&D and suddenly they have the most advanced technology that people are not ever, that people have never seen. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a big example is the U.S., of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, when the, when they first started the forays into Iraq, you know, the first Iraq war in 1991, all of the Allied forces were prepared for a ground assault from the Soviet Union in Western Europe. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden you're in... You're in Iraq, you're in the desert, there's sand everywhere, you know, the, the, the conditions are totally different. So then that forces the innovation. But there, but there is that massive change in the environment that, that did it. 
you know, f- then. Yeah, that's true. I'm like, I'm now, I'm now thinking about the question, like, okay, what would be the next big cycle? What would be the next big cycle after the current cycle we are in at? The big cycle is now is software, right? Software will eat everything driven by data. Right. Yeah, I can imagine that it could go towards AI. And then I'm like, okay, after AI, we don't have to do anything anymore. We are going to get some basic income every month, stay at home, and just enjoy our life the rest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, I can't remember the name of the guy. He died relatively recently and he wrote that book or a paper or something, Bullshit Jobs. Okay. And he was saying, look, you know, we, I can't remember what it was. It was probably before the Second World War. People were saying, well, we've invented everything that we're going to possibly need. What we want now is future leisure time. Right. And, and what he said was, we've managed to create all these bullshit jobs in order to prop up the economy. <laughs> you know, they, they, who really needs a social media manager? You know, what value does it really create? And so on and so on and so on, right? Do we, you know, do we really, is our, is our life really enhanced by it? Wow. Well, if you're a social media manager, you probably make the case that it is. But uh, you know that's that's the I mean it's a it's a it's a daft title right it's a controversial title but that's the point he's ma- really making is w- so many of us have jobs well what value is it really creating because a hundred years ago we already identified that what we wanted was to work less and to be able to pursue our own interests more. I think it's good the the new upcoming cycles especially uh, uh, because of the fact that. AI, there is more being invested in AI, more, more and more software are being, are replacing people, their jobs itself. I don't know if it's inevitable that we are going towards that point where more and more jobs are becoming bullshit jobs where <laughs> it's being replaced by software. <laughs> well, I suppose the, the big one that people keep coming back to now is, is sort of green revolution, isn't it? Right. Actually, you, you, if the government, if successive governments wanted to prioritize clean growth, that would lead to right. many, many innovations. Yeah. That would be, that would employ people, create economic growth, and create a better environment. The challenge is that we're locked into, it's the same challenge. We're locked into a system where it's demand supply and it's like people's jobs and so on and so on and so on. So how do you create that transition from our economic mode, which is essentially the same as the industrial revolution model? Oh, there's some resources over there. Let's buy them and produce something without really much consideration about its impact. Right into one that it's, you know, more holistic in its nature. Hmm. Interesting point. So this is not an easy, you know, easy solution. I mean, we've gone from like, oh, we all love innovation and creative destruction is exciting to, oh my God, it's actually really difficult. The creative, yeah. To balance, yeah, to balance the needs of, complex societies you know diverse political drivers and the needs of economic development well it's it makes me think and question whether the current innovation models which are focused on the needs um, of users or end users like they have a certain problem they need solutions or they have already solutions. They need enhancement of those solutions. Like are those models um, cycle proof or shampoo to proof basically? Like do they consider the fact that um, after a few years, 10 years or something or 15 years or eight years, the whole model you have just created isn't 
going to fit in the new cycle that your industry is going towards. So Clayton Christensen, the guy who did the disruption theory, mm -hmm. he talked about the idea of jobs to be done, which is adopted then by Osterwalder right. for business model innovation. And the idea is that goods and services is not the point. The point is that there is a job that needs to be done and we hire goods and services to do that job for us. So therefore, innovation comes from being able to identify what people's jobs are and then developing uh, an efficient and effective means to do that. And that's the, that's, that's the universal driver for coming up with an innovation. Well, what, what does it actually do? Yeah. You know, so whether something lasts for 10 years or 100 years, does it do that job? Right. Still. Right. And then you can use different means in order to lock people in, right? So people will always need to, sh to shave. <laughs> yeah. But for Gillette, it's it's much easier and more effective for them to lock people in by selling cheap razors and expensive blades so you're locked into their system exactly but what we what then happens is is there a technological or a market development that then allows an entrepreneur to come up with a different way that would break that cycle exactly hmm. but the job is still the same one yeah, that's true. And, I, and, I'm now, and, I, and then I'm like now uh, questioning, like, is it relevant to consider the, the cycles, the disruption in the flows of the industry, like Sean Peter says? It may be these innovation, current innovation models helps you to create a startup or create an uh, innovation which could ha lead you to a, uh, to a nice company where you could uh, get rent from the monopoly you are going to create. So yes, and if you personally consider the fact that uh, that after five years or uh, after X amount of time, there is going to be a new cycle. So uh, sell your company and start a new business model. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's a really interesting thing. You know, when you talked earlier about Elon Musk, right, and he has been remarkably successful because he did PayPal first right. and now he's done Tesla and you know now he, and after that he's going to go to Mars right and then he's going to do the hyperloop and so on and so on but there are very few entrepreneurs that can jump between products or services in a completely different way that is true. If it was that easy, everybody would be doing it. So th there must be something about entrepreneurship that is about timing, getting on that wave at the right time. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, and other factors, you know, is there capital available? Have you had the right technical background to recognize the opportunity? And so on and so on, you know. That's true. I think you, you're you touching a good point because I mean, there's I just Googled Elon Musk's founding companies and he, he started in 1995 Zip2, company uh, who zips files, and then eventually he went, uh, like, uh, in, in 1999, he created PayPal, 2002 SpaceX, 2003 Tesla, and then SolarCity, Hyperloop, o OpenAI, Neuralink, and then the boring company, the most recent one. And I'm like, this, yes, I agree with you that he definitely finds opportunity in all those new cycles. So, for example, there would be a reason why he um, started OpenAI in 2015 and not in 1998 or something. Right. It was, this is the stuff of movies in 1998. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, 
I think he definitely taps on uh, the opportunities within the current cycle where he uh, sees and recognizes the opportunity. And th uh, his environment definitely helps him create those companies because there is a reason why the majority of inventions or innovations happen easily in the US and not in Europe or Africa or Asia. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of factors. Exactly. And, and, and there you have, for example, if you invent something in Silicon Valley, the chances are high you would speak on a weekly basis to in investors instead of, <laughs> instead of if you lived in the Netherlands or even in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Asia or China or something. You wouldn't be able to stock easily to investors to help you. Well, I think that's there's something very interesting about um the idea of the american dream and i don't want to like flag wave or anything like that but the american dream is merely a representation of the american psyche mm -hmm. so the 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 fact is that within america what you end up what what you've ended up with is as a result of economic historic geographic factors is the idea of a new country that that has a disruptive separation from its founding countries right either the netherlands in new york mm -hmm. or the right. uk or france okay and you also have um, so that so there's there is something there about doing new things and that the, the idea that the the new idea is just over the brow of the hill around the corner whereas in europe what you have is this uh historic continuity that you can't get away from that's true right you also have in america an enormous market right? it's 300 million people true and yeah, okay. So the the EU market is roughly the same size, but is complicated because it's multiple twenty seven countries, right? Twenty eight, right. including Britain. It, it there's a lot of cultural differences, even though it's one kind of market, right? And then you have the idea of capital, uh, and whereas America has embraced creative destruction. Mm -hmm. And Silicon Valley is the epitome of that. And Silicon Valley prospers because of those three things, but also because it's digital. And digital is much easier to export than widgets. That's true. And so in Europe, we are held back by some of those things. We don't have the same level of patient capital that you do in uh, venture capitalists. True. True. The idea of entrepreneurship isn't as as well grounded or accepted. The idea of a dream, an American dream, of this what Schumpeter was talking about, this ability to be able to uh, get ideas above your station, right, right, and go for them, right. And then you know, finally, is the sort of historic uh, and cultural um, continuity that we have in. In Europe, right. So in in Britain, for example, you know, it's like, well, unless you're a member of the old aristocratic classes, you're really not a person. Right? It doesn't matter how much money you make. <laughs> uh, you, you know, w whereas in sort of the heartland of Europe, the concern is around we don't want creative destruction because it might lead to uh, another conflict. You know, war conflict. Yeah, that's true. I recognize that a lot. And. And the tensions the, the the EU is trying to balance is that you have a wide range of political viewpoints. Right. You know, different social histories. And but but an overwhelming need for for economic development. But but the overwhelming need for economic development doesn't negate the other two to allow creative destruction to happen. So you get lower lower growth, yeah, and and a preference towards R and D rather than, you know, hardcore innovation.
Yeah, true. And and it's regulated a lot. Right. So it's like con- they they like controlled innovation, controlled breakthrough innovation even, without a lot of disruption. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They allow it, but they want it to go through a controlled process. <laughs> a controlled process of scaling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. I, I, I don't know, but I can't stop thinking like, okay, what is that? What is this theory of Shampoo means to me? So how can I use it now for me in my um, in my journey of creating a startup or creating a business, whatever it is? So so he talks about flow. He talks about those cycles, disruption in the flow, those cycles, and the entrepreneurial uh, spirit. You are you, you entrepreneur uh, the entrepreneur itself. And the combination of the capital and technical expert. I'm like, okay, how can I use this theory and put it in practice for myself to 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 find my innovation or breakthrough innovation? That's the question in my mind. What do you think? I I, I have the same question. Yeah. Hmm. An interesting perspective from Sean put it to it makes me it makes me think continuously about new ideas like okay what if, what is the new cycle how can i uh, recognize what what is the new opportunity within this cycle go <laughs> and i think that's the benefit of Schumpeter is that top level view right is that it opens up the paradigm of thinking true yeah you know, with with the classical economics, it's like demand and supply. It doesn't force you to think outside of that. Whereas Schumpeter acknowledges that it's the entrepreneur, the internal drivers of the entrepreneur, that is that is one of the key factors in the creation of new products and services. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a problem with our education system. It doesn't really allow enough of that. I agree with that, 100%. I mean, but I do think with Schumpeter, it is that macro view. It is about connecting the the drivers of the individual to your environment. And, and understanding the innovation is a different function to either invention or to management. Right. And I think that's the real strength of creative destruction. You know, we can argue about the political impact and how you leverage it and so on, but on an individual level, what it does is allow you to see that growth comes from altering the flow Right. And you need new products, new ideas, new services to alter that flow. And there is a route for that. And I think that's the real strength of Schumpeter. Yeah, I agree with that. Definitely. It comes down to back to the human part of uh, of innovation or any change within an economic industry, um, economic environments, or you call it any type of industry, come back to the to in, to the individual itself, yeah, and the collective, uh, the and the, and the whole society as itself also. In this cycle, he says the disruption exactly as you said comes from can come from an entrepreneur, with the combination of the capitalist and the uh, and the technical expert, but um, the individuals, the collection, the, the 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 sum of all the individuals is the new cycle, the way they behave themselves. Therefore look to the new cycle and try to find new new disruption in the flow of those cycles. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and it's interesting that that's this model also with <laughs> like the other models we discussed until now, it all comes down to the individual itself. That it it shows also that there is no holy grail for innovation. And it isn't. It doesn't come down to the tool or a tool or a method or, or or a particular book or a particular idea itself. Hi, Alex here. I'm back to close out this episode of the Innovation Book Club with a few prompts and questions to take your learning further. 
Before we start, however, here's a quick note about why we're actually doing this. We believe that the value of learning is not in knowledge acquisition. Its value lies in the reflection process. When you judge the value of the knowledge that you've been exposed to, you understand how that analysis changes your view of the world and then ultimately how that knowledge and understanding increases both your capacity and capability to engage with and shape the world around you. So to that end, what we've done is we've come up with a few questions to help you reflect on what you've just heard and to try and push you on with your own innovation learning journey. So here they are. Number one, to what extent do you agree with Schumpeter's observations about how capitalism functions? Number two, if you were a politician, would you embrace creative destruction, reject it, or just try and manage its impact. Why? Number three, when was the last time the sector you worked in experienced creative destruction? And what will be the underlying factors that would have to change for creative destruction to happen again? These questions are also in the podcast notes together with additional links if you'd like to read or watch something else related to this episode. Good luck with your answers and let us know how you get on. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Innovation Book Club. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can do three things to help us grow our audience. First of all, please leave us a five-star review on your podcatcher of choice. This helps to feed the algorithm. Second, share this episode with your friends and colleagues if you think they would benefit. And finally, if you'd like to listen to all future episodes of the Innovation Book Club as soon as they're available, then please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. In the meantime, take care and we'll be back soon.